Hi, Deborah. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Good. I'm Sarah Posner, and this is The Posner Show. And my guest today is Deborah Hafner. She is the president and co-founder of the Religious Institute. She's also an ordained Unitarian minister and a sexologist and an advocate for uh, sex education and uh, sexual justice. And she's here to talk to me today about the legacy of C. Everett Koop, who died uh, this past Monday. So, Deborah, I was interested um, in your tweets about Dr. Mm -hmm. Koop. Um, one of them in particular, uh, you thanked him or acknowledged him for having told the truth about abortion. Mm -hmm. And for a minute, I did a double take uh, because I think that Koop is known to uh, anti-choice activists as uh, the as the person who worked with Francis Schaeffer on uh, whatever happened to the human race, which was a rallying cry, really, for the anti-choice mm -hmm. movement. And mm -hmm. he was an ardent foe of abortion. But I think you were talking about a slightly different issue um, that Dr. Koop got involved in as he was uh, Surgeon General under President Reagan. Right. So I was, um, I've had a long career in this field, and right. um, I was actually working at a Planned Parenthood in the 19, early 1980s when um, Koop was doing some of his anti abortion work. And when he was announced as Surgeon General under the Reagan administration in the, um, uh, in, in the early 1980s, um, or mid-1980s, um, I certainly was one of those people who took a position against him and why mm -hmm. he shouldn't have been confirmed because of that anti-abortion fever. But one of the things he did that um, I remember very well when I was the director of information and training for the Center for Population Options was that he convened a committee to um, look at the physical and mental health implications of abortion, intending, I think, to prove that abortion was harmful. Um, and harmful the myth at the time, um, and continues to be a myth somewhat, um, mm -hmm. in the anti-abortion community was that right. abortion caused grave physical and mental health harm. Those of us who had been working on reproductive choice and indeed um, had worked in family planning clinics knew that that couldn't possibly be the case because of the numbers of people we knew personally as well as the number of people we served um, who, you know, his primary reaction was relief, not distress. Um, uh, so he, in the public health service, convened a commission, and I don't know the year, but um, released a report saying, much to my surprise, I found out that there was no mental health or physical harm from abortion. And one of the things that um, I just loved about him, and I think the country loved about him, is that he was very clear. He would say, and I'm paraphrasing, um, but he would say something to the effect of, I am the nation's doctor. I am not the nation's preacher. Mm. And so he always, and this was true for his work in the AIDS epidemic, he always put the science first. And so when he couldn't prove that abortion was harmful, um, he stood up and said, there is no harm to the woman. I thought that there was some controversy about the way he relayed that information, because I, I thought I read somewhere that he was supposed to write a report, but when he found out that, or when he concluded that there was no scientific evidence of harm to women who have abortions, uh, that he decided to write a letter to President Reagan. That, I'm sorry, sticking a little letter. letter. That he decided to write a letter to President Reagan instead of issuing a report? Is that You know, right? I don't know the details. I do know that it was very public. Um, mm -hmm. I do remember as an activist, we were all, you know, quite surprised and quite pleased, and we quoted it like crazy. So it, um, whether it was a full report or a letter, it was certainly a public statement. So as, as somebody who was involved in that kind of activism at that time, how, how surprised were you when President Reagan nominated, to be, not, nominated him to be a tr uh, attorney general, sorry, surgeon general? Um, was that... Was it regarded as an attempt to politicize that post because of Coop's role in the anti-abortion movement? You know, I, I don't want to uh, be an expert on something, and it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think 
um, as I recall, there was a concern, that certainly was the concern. Um, um, I'm sure we could find letters that were written by Planned Parenthood Federation and by NARAL and by APHA about why he was not an appropriate candidate. You know, I think we have seen men, um, and particularly men, of uh, great character who have been appointed to offices and who have surprised us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we think about some of the Supreme Court justices, who people thought, who ended up, you know, in looking at the facts of the cases, um, ended up being much stronger supporters. Um, and I think what Surgeon General Coop proved was that he was indeed a scientist. He was indeed a medical professional, and he saw his role as being the nation's doctor. And he used, you know, my I think much more important than his role in abortion, though, and I assume we're going to get to this, is his role in the AIDS right. epidemic, which was right. um, heroic and groundbreaking and surprising. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that he became one of my heroes in the government is mm -hmm. not what one would have anticipated when we were saying, no, don't elect him. You know, don't appoint right. him. No, don't appoint him. Right. Um, I do want to get to the AIDS uh, uh, issue in a minute, but I, I, w I wanted to talk a little bit more about the abortion issue um, because I think that, I mean, after he passed away on Monday, uh, I was reading coverage of him and, and, and there was a, a fair bit of coverage that, that is echoing what you what you're saying, particularly with regards to AIDS and that ha how he was uh, dependent on the evidence, on the scientific mm -hmm. evidence as opposed to ideology. Um, but what was interesting to me is that after he passed away, he, he got a lot of praise from anti-abortion groups who it seemed were trying to claim him as one of their mm -hmm. own. When in fact, in, in many arenas, it seems like they are disregarding what he actually stood for. Yet, yes, he was a foe of abortion. Mm -hmm. He was morally opposed to it. Mm -hmm. Yet he, uh, he refused to make up evidence about this harm. Mm -hmm. Yet that is the, it, it's such a central part of efforts to legislate against abortion in the states that with the right to know laws mm -hmm. um, require that that have passed in a lot of states require doctors to uh, list to women mm -hmm. these alleged uh, physical and psychological harms to them as a result of having an abortion and so this flies in the face of what dr. Coop mm -hmm. did yet they're claiming that he was a hero to to their movement but it's sort of ironic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I would guess, you know, if he had been asked in recent years about things that interfered with women's health, that put more women at risk, that increased the amount of time that women went from first trimesters to later trimester abortions because of waiting periods, because of consent, because of, you know, trap laws, because of lack of clinics, etc. Mm -hmm. My guess is he would have been against that. Um, hmm. And, you know, I think it's important for those of us in the pro-choice movement. I'll, actually, I think we just read we're not supposed to call ourselves the pro-choice movement anymore. Um, but <laughs> That's another issue, right. <laughs> um, those of us who support women's access to abortion services and women's moral agencies to make their own decisions, um, uh, I think we have to acknowledge that there are people of good faith and good character who oppose abortion on moral grounds. And, um, you know, and of course, the flip thing is to say, well, then they shouldn't have have abortions, right? Um, but, you know, I think abortion is a much more morally complex issue than we have been willing to engage. And mm -hmm. what he did was he separated his uh, moral beliefs from his medical beliefs. And, um, you know, there's no question he was strongly um, anti-abortion uh, um, before he became Surgeon General. Um, and I don't really know, to be honest, what he did once he was not, you know, whether he continued to speak out um, against abortion. But certainly as the leader of uh, the public health service, he was quite clear about what his responsibility was. And goodness knows in the last, you know, 10 years, we have continued to fight and, um, and, and evermore the idea that um, science should be driving public health policy. And even mm -hmm. in this administration um, on, for example, holding up Plan B access to adolescents, we continue to see that politics trumps um, medical science. And Surgeon General Coop would have none of that. Um, mm -hmm. I frankly wish we were hearing from the current, um, I frankly wish we were hearing from the current Surgeon General now um, about why what the FDA did was wrong. And we're not. 
In fact, I would bet most of your listeners have no idea who she is or what her name is. So, and what the FDA did wrong, you're, you're talking specifically with regard to uh, Plan B access for adolescents, for, for, for women and girls under 17. Right, that, they, that yeah. they held, that they decided that Plan B, even though all the medical evidence suggests that Plan B access for teenagers would in fact be positive, um, have, without a prescription, have continued to require um, parental permission. Mm -hmm. Do you know if, if Dr. Coop ever discussed emergency contraception at all or contraception? I mean, was he, he was not opposed to contraception on moral grounds as far as... No, you know, not at he, all. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think, I think he was well in his 80s before we had emergency contraception. So <laughs> okay. I'm guessing it wasn't part of anything that he talked about. I did just find out, um, someone told me that he remarried three years ago at the age of 93. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So sexuality was obviously an important part of his life. Um, when I took him to Hollywood, um, uh, and, and uh, I just reread yesterday the speech that he gave at that meeting, and it was phenomenal, Sarah. I Wait, mean, I, I want you to talk a little bit more about that, how you ended up going to Hollywood with Dr. King. I know, right. Is that... Um, uh, and. And there's a, there's a Betty White story in here, too? Yeah, there's a Golden yeah. Girl story. Um, so I was working at the Center for Population Options and in the, from 1985 to 88, and uh, I had worked in the public health service. Um, I did my internship in public health school in the uh, Bureau of Community Health Services, and for a period of time, I actually wrote... Um, with uh, Dr. Carol Garvey, the standards for family planning in community health centers. And I did it under a man named Michael Samuels. And uh, Dr. Samuels, uh, uh, who's now a public health professor, Dr. Samuels, um, during the AIDS epidemic and during Surgeon General Coop's um, term, ended up as the special assistant in Dr. Coop's office. And what some of your listeners may not know is that Dr. Coop um, Congress had mandated that a, that a pamphlet go to every person in America on AIDS. I don't remember the year, 85, 86. Mm -hmm. And um, Coop wrote this pamphlet. And in the pamphlet, he called for sex education beginning as early as the third grade. So I was running a sex sexuality education program for a national organization. That national organization is now called Advocates for Youth, for people who don't know the Center for Population Options. And um, and so I had worked for Mike. And so I picked up the phone and I called him and I said, and he got great uh, um, public attention for calling for sex education in the third grade in this pamphlet. He presumably, and I don't know if this is apocryphal or real, he had presumably written that pamphlet and sent it out without approval of the White House. Um, and it was very brave. It called for clean needles. It called for better education for men having sex with men. Um, and it called for sex education. So I called Michael and I said, tell me what you meant by the call for sex education beginning in the third grade. I mean, that was really quite unheard of in a public discourse at that time. And what he said to me is, I don't know, Deborah, we need your help figuring that out. <laughs> So as we started to um, talk about it, um, and I did provide some assistance, and my organization provided some assistance, um, we started to talk about uh, what my organ the organization, I was uh, uh, not the head of it, um, I was a, a director, what we could do. And, and CPO had a program called the Media Project, which was working to integrate messages about sexual responsibility, contraceptive use, um, into entertainment programming. So when I told him about that, he said, Michael said to me, um, Coop really wants to meet Hollywood. And I said, oh, we can do that. I know how to do that. So um, we arranged, a woman named Marcy Kelly, who ran that project at the time, um, went to the Caucus of Writers and Producers, and we put on an event out in Los Angeles um, for the writers and producers um, of uh, entertainment TV. And there were people there from, uh, this is going to date me, uh, from St. Elsewhere, from L.A. Law, <laughs> um, uh, you know, big shows who wanted right. to do something. And, and 
you know, I think for younger people, it's hard to remember, I'm sure you do, but the urgency around the AIDS epidemic. I mean, we had, you know, the, the amount of fear and, and the death we were surrounded with was just mm -hmm. astronomical. Um, um, and the fear was that, this, that AIDS was going to move into the general population um, actually quicker than, than it did. Um, and so um, he came and um, I was his escort. Um, and so Michael Samuels and Marcy Kelly and uh, uh, Dr. Coop and I spent a day and it included, um, we had breakfast with Morgan Fairchild. Mm -hmm. um, who was very prominent actress. I don't know what she's doing now. Mm -hmm. And then we had um, lunch with Patty Duke Austin. And I had watched Patty Duke as a kid every day after high school. So, you know, that was a huge thing for me. Identical Cousins, was that the show? What'd you say? Identical Cousins. Right, wasn't right. I could show? sing you the song, but I won't. <laughs> um, and so yeah, we had lunch with I her. And it, um, he, had, he did this incredible um, speech, which, um, you know, I, I don't know how we could get a copy of it posted, but... Uh, mm -hmm. It was, I read it I'll yesterday and it, it could have been, it could be given now, you know, and he talked about how sexuality was wonderful and how sexuality didn't have, sexual behaviors don't have to include intercourse. And he called for clean needles and he called for us to have a different attitude um, about making sure that everyone was safe and everyone was included, whether we agreed with their behaviors or not. I mean, it was stunning. And um, so it, I have to say, and I was I was a, a young thirty two year old um, at the time, um, so I was just gaga, you know, the whole day meeting these folks. But he was gaga, and what was so fun about it was that Hollywood was thrilled to meet him, mm -hmm. and he was thrilled to meet Hollywood. So what happened that night was um, it, we came on a Friday, and apparently, at, at least at that time, TV programs taped on Friday nights um, in front of sitcoms in front of live audiences. And so he was asked what was his favorite program, and his favorite program was The Golden Girls. So we went to a taping of The Golden Girls, and um, I got to watch, sit in the audience. And at the end of it, after everyone had left, we were invited onto the set of The Golden Girls. And we spent about 45 minutes with Dr. Coop and Betty White and B. Arthur and Rue McClanahan um, and Estelle Getty talking about the AIDS epidemic and what they could do and what kind of leadership and how they would integrate it into one of their scripts. Um, and uh, so I have a great picture that I put on Facebook of me hanging out on the set of the Golden Girls with uh, Surgeon General Coop. Somebody yesterday, when I, I posted it yesterday and they said, was, was I sure I hadn't photoshopped it because what was Deborah Hafner, Surgeon General Coop and the Golden Girls all doing in the same picture? <laughs> which I thought was really funny. Um, and uh, the end of that story, which is also amusing, is the next day, Variety, the Hollywood paper, covered his trip on the front page. Um, you know, Surgeon General Coop comes to Hollywood, and it said, and he ended his day with his very young wife on the set of The Golden Girls. <laughs> Which I felt really bad about. I think he'd been married for 45 years to the same woman, you know, who was probably 65 or 70 at this point. Oh, Variety could use a little fact checking, right? right? right. <laughs> so, so for a day, I got to be Dr. Coop's very young wife. So it wasn't just with regard to, to the sex education end of, of mm -hmm. things. He was also instrumental in pushing for uh, approval of drugs to treat AIDS. I'm sorry, right? again. Just a little louder. He was also involved. So at the time, the Reagan administration was dragging its heels on approving drugs to treat mm -hmm. AIDS. And for anyone who saw the Oscar-nominated movie documentary, How to Survive a Plague, mm -hmm. um, that was pretty much documented in mm -hmm. that movie, how the Reagan administration was dragging its heels and the role of ACT UP in right. pushing the administration to, to um, approve drugs. Uh, what was Coop's role in all of that? Because I think that he was one person within the administration who did see the need for quicker approval. Yeah, you know, he spoke up on on all of the things that needed to be done. So, you know, he, he managed to get the CDC more involved. It's hard to believe, but I, I but as I recall, I don't think President Reagan ever actually even said the word AIDS. 
Um, uh, there was a real sense of denial, and Bill Bennett was running the Department of Education, and he was actually ap actively fighting AIDS education at the time. So although I don't specifically know um, what was being, what specifically what was being, he said in terms of, of drug renewal, um, I do know that he was talking about clean needles, which is, mm -hmm. you know, still controversial. Um, uh, whoa, these many years later, um, mm -hmm. he was uh, talking about the need for treatment um, as well as the need for primary prevention, and he was, you know, hotly criticized. Um, and um, the fact that, you know, I think there is an irony, though, he kept his job. You know, he he he. The Reagan administration did not stop. Him. Um, mm -hmm. I think when Rock Hudson died, that was probably helpful in terms of Reagan stopping working against AIDS. Um, you know, I mean, actively uh, working against things. There was a sense that people were more vulnerable, um, that uh, uh, people people knew were having this disease. Um, so that was definitely a teachable moment. Um, but the reason I think sir, if you were interviewing my colleagues who were part of um, and friends who were part of ACT UP, who were part of the AIDS um, movement in the mid 80s, they were, again, remarkably surprised by the role that he took, you know, that mm -hmm. he was willing to stand up and and speak out in a way from a science based perspective um, and what we really needed. Um, and he was very clear that that the idea that we were losing a whole generation of young men was a tragedy and he would do what he had to to keep that from happening. So on the sex education front, what was his legacy exactly? It, I mean, did he leave a mark on sex um, It was sex education huge. Um, I took over SIGAS um, the following year. So we brought him, uh, I brought him to Hollywood in the September of 87 and I was the president of the Sex Information Education Council um, by 1980, in, in 1988. Um, so only a few months later. And in fact, Sikas was uh, really having a difficult time at that point. Um, and I remember saying to the board of the search committee, if C we cannot make Sikas a bigger, um, more important organization, a more influential organization, given the call for sex edu education from the public health service, you know, then it was time for this organization to go to bed. And I thought we were at a, a Kairos moment, a moment, you know, of real change. By the end of 1989, Every state in the country had an AIDS had passed AIDS education legislation. Every state in the country. It took about a year and a half, and I completely credit Surgeon General Coop with that. I mean, it was you know there were three states that had sex education, but all fifty states had an AIDS education program in place. Um, so the urgency, the dialogue about it, the discussion about it, the understanding that um, AIDS was going to uh, not just affect uh, men who had sex with men, but was increasingly affecting. Um, and he actually, in this speech um, that I'm referring to, he talked about its disproportionate impact on the Hispanic and Latino communities. Um, uh, the need for looking at, and what was interesting in his speech, it was only in 1987 that we really began to understand that AIDS was being spread um, by heterosexual intercourse. Um, and so um, he changed the dialogue. And I think mm -hmm. that trip to Hollywood changed the Hollywood dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. We really began to see that um, everyday programs, um, I was just thinking this morning, I don't know if you got, did you watch The Makers last night? I didn't get a chance to now. No. So it was a really interesting program that I recommend to you and, and your viewers, although, you know, there's a lot we could quibble about um, and things I wish they had done. But um, they covered the gold. They had a little bit on, on women in, in TV and designing women back in, I don't remember, 1990, uh, maybe 1991, right, right. did an amazing program on AIDS education. And I can, rem I, can, I can remember there were a number of other programs. And I think that he... He changed um, the America's understanding that AIDS was about everybody. And up until his bravery, AIDS was considered among the general population something that only happened to them. And he was very clear that this was a disease that we all had to be concerned about. And, you know, it's hard for p young people today. Um, I have a 19-year-old son. It's hard for young people today to, to understand that, you know, kids with AIDS were thrown out of school and mm -hmm. people with AIDS um, were burned and people wouldn't sit next to people with AIDS. And, um, I mean, the level of discrimination and hate that happened um, 
and he made a difference on that. And, you know, there, I, I really view him, um, and my little brush with him as one of the highlights of my, of, you know, my th almost 35 year career. So did he, did his discussions of, of sex education have any impact on sex education beyond AIDS education? I mean, because I think now people tend to think Republicans, abstinence education, opposition to comprehensive sex education. Did he have any role in in in, in well? So what happened more when, you know, when, when states passed these AIDS education mandates? They began to have, they began to talk about sex in the classroom. I mean, you know, you um, you couldn't do AIDS education without addressing sexual transmission. Um, and um, so we began to see some states really look at uh, what was being offered. Now, the, there was a counterbalancing moment, which was it was in 1991 and 1992 that the first um, significant federal monies became available for what I at Seekist labeled fear-based education. Um, the whole abstinence only until marriage stuff did not uh, rise out of the out of nowhere in 1997 with TAMF, but actually was beginning to really have an impact in the early 1990s. And so um, the pushback on AIDS education became a pushback to sexuality education. And we saw um, programs like Sex Respect, which taught um, pet your dog, match your date. We saw there was a movie that was circulating in the early 1990s that held a revolver into the camera, and it said, um, using a condom to prevent AIDS is like playing Russian roulette. Sooner or later, everyone will die. Um, so um, he did not have the impact, um, you know, long-term impact. We're still fighting what the content of sex education in the school should be. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People like myself, actually, I think I actually have come in recent years to believe that we basically should give up on the schools as a place where kids are going to get information about things like homosexuality and pleasure and real prevention information, um, that we need to be looking more towards the churches and the synagogues where values education is okay. We need to be looking more towards um, the internet as a place where people, can, young people can get honest information. I think what I used to say at SICUS is that on sex education, we won um, the war, which is everyone agrees the school should cover issues like puberty and uh, family roles and responsibility and uh, taking good care of your body and treating people with respect. And that's not controversial. The areas that are controversial, homosexuality, abortion, contraception, masturbation, they were controversial when I started in this field. And unfortunately, in 2013, they they're controversial still. Right, right. Well, maybe we can talk about all of that in another Great. I'd episode. love that. So um, thank you so much for sharing, especially the Hollywood story about Dr. King. I know. So fun, right? And um, I think uh, that will be in your memoir someday. But before you write your memoir, I think you have a new book out on another topic. Is that right? I do. Um, I've uh, just published um, this little book um, called Meditations on the Good News, Reading the Bible for Today. And it's um, a, a new book designed to help people who have actually rejected the Bible or think it's irrelevant see that um, there is wisdom in the Bible for all of us, whether you are a literalist or whether you are somebody who has thinks, why, why do people still read this book? Um, so I took 40 passages that talk about why the Bible teaches us to lead a joyful, um, enriched, fulfilling life um, that countered the idea that the Bible only teaches us that life is sinful. Um, and um, I hope that it's a way for people who have not uh, been interested in the Bible to maybe find their way in. Okay. Well, listen, thanks so much for doing this today. Thank you. Thank you for all you do, Sarah. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.